Russia has been completely hysterical over the last year. We are told that there are huge skyscrapers of meat factories in which Uyghurs are being chopped up and made into mince meats, and that meat is being exported to Africa and making us all carnivals and so on. I'm sure everybody's aware of our history. We suffered 400 years of a transatlantic slave trade in which our best youth, male and female, were captured, were transported across the Atlantic Ocean and became chattel, became beasts of burden to resource the growth of the United States, but also significant colonies in the Caribbean and then Brazil and so on. So many, many cultures, many, many civilizations were destroyed as part of keeping the slave trade going. I'm sure you're also all aware that following the collapse of slavery in the United States as a result of the resistance of slaves themselves, as a result of changes in people's sense of the morality of things, partly because of the resistance and other things, that Europe in particular needed to find a new economy to replace the slave trading economy, which is when they hit on the brilliant idea of colonization. If you can't sell the people, control their resources all the minerals and the energy resources that I spoke about earlier. So colonialism was essentially about converting Africa into a series of resource concessions owned by competing European states. It meant that we were set back even further because the only development we saw was the development required to facilitate exports of raw materials from our continent to Europe to be processed, and then in some cases sold back to us. But mostly we were not a major importer, a major market for these products. Then, after the Second World War, when Europe was simply too weak to forcibly retain control over its African possessions, they hit on the grand strategy of slowly, grudgingly allowing what we call flag and anthem independence. So allow people to feel they've established states. Allow them to have their own presidents, their own national anthems and their own flags to wave around. Even join the UN but maintain the essential character of the colonial economy in which every decision is made to facilitate European extraction of resources from Africa. Except of course that now standing beside and above the Europeans was the United States, which itself had not been an African colonial power and had very much wanted to become an African colonial power and one of the conditions for their participation in the reconstruction of Europe after the war, of course, not presented as a simple economic play, represented as um, the accession of liberal values, American values, freedom for everybody and so on. But what it essentially meant was that now America gets a larger piece of the pie and indeed ends up guaranteeing the stability of a neo-colonial regime. However, Neo-colonialism as an imperial strategy has failed. It has failed across Africa. It has allowed 54 situations of resistance, of growing resistance, a chaotic situation. It has not allowed the West to optimize its extraction in a smooth way. It's a daily struggle. And I think that neocolonialism was always an experiment to see if we can manage our exploitation and repression this way. And having failed, the West has made the simple, obvious decision, end it, take over again. 
There are obviously huge complexities about the manner in which this reassertion of direct imperial control will happen. There are many, many different things going on. So the first is, if you like, the battle for hearts and minds, ideological warfare. The West, for reasons of its colonial history and for reasons of just the sheer effort it puts into it, dominates the African media scene, especially as regards how Africa sees the rest of the world, for example, Russia, Ukraine, or US, China, are presented to Africa directly by a handful of Western or Western allied media houses. BBC, I think, remains the most influential broadcaster in Africa, but it's not the only one. All of these stations, government funded, direct you know, agencies, if you like, of various ministries of foreign affairs, maintain 24 hour a day with the main purpose of shaping how we think, particularly about conflict situations or coming conflict situations. And that's important because even the indigenous African stations, because we seldom have the capacity for independent news gathering, you'll find that station after station collects its international news direct from one of these other stations. In most cases, without even editing the language, you hear the same report on a Ghanaian radio station that you hear on BBC, same word for word reproduction. And you also have, though increasingly perhaps less influential with the masses, but important for the quote unquote intellectual classes, huge, a huge effort to control what the print media does. So the Bentworth Foundation that funds a lot of media in Africa in alliance often with the National Endowment for Democracy, which is actually a State Department agency. And so there's a system of research grants, there's a system of fellowships, um, revolving doors between media houses and these foundations. And there are even allegations of direct personal payments to journalists, which ensure that they produce a certain kind of content. And because they are better resourced, and because they're better able to produce the glossy media stuff and so on, they tend to dominate the written media. Now, the messaging they're putting out there, setting that, you know, essentially we're being told that development means being more like the US, being more like Western Europea, Europe. But there's also increasingly a shrill and very crude kind of propaganda being waged against the countries that the West considers its enemies. Russia has been completely hysterical over the last year. We are told that there are huge skyscrapers of meat factories in which, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Uyghurs are being chopped up and made into mince meat, and that meat is being exported to Africa and making us all carnivores and so on. I, I know it sounds crazy, and I know it's, I, I've learned in the last week how difficult it is for the Chinese public to take this seriously. But again, the point I was making is that the media assault is total. It's not just about these silly stories. It also involves an ideological orientation towards the mystic, towards superstition, towards irrationality. So you find in the African media that the media houses that thrive are those that are providing support to some of these wildly right-wing evangelical churches. And they have money to pay huge money for advertising space. 
Typically in Africa, the first few hours of the day, from 4 o'clock to like 6.30, are occupied by religious sermons. You have a priest launching into all sorts of things. And this is what people start their day with. So you have to understand that in a context in which people have become so used to irrationality, stories that suggest that other parts of the world are driven by irrational behavior are not difficult to swallow. So it is true that the propaganda being waged against China, being waged against Russia, are ridiculous. But don't dismiss them just because of that.